We good? All right, there we are. It has come and gone, and as you can see, we have a lot traveling this morning and uh, traveling away from Macon, and we have a few this morning that have come to Macon traveling. And so Debbie and Mr. Bill Lott, it's good to have you here this morning. Ms. Boer, all the way from Indiana, is here with us this morning. The weather's nice down here at this time of year, ain't it? And Rachel, it is so good to see you. I know that your grandfather is so glad that you are here this morning. And so, yeah, and Brother Tim's gone this morning too, so you... I guess you have to put up with me this morning, uh, sharing God's Word, but uh, it is so good to be with you this morning, and I just pray that God would speak to us. And uh, this is a message that uh, God has been preaching to me for the last six months, so I'm excited to share it with you this morning. And one cool thing is, and how God works, uh, Miss Lynn Starr, she gives me a passage every Sunday morning. Every Sunday morning, without a shadow of a doubt, she's going to give me a passage, and she says, this is your passage for the day. And so this morning, she gives me this car, and she had wrote on it while she was at the house. And I said, Miss Lynn, did you know I was preaching on this passage? And she says, no. And I said, really? Well, that, you know, that is the message that I needed to hear this morning. So thank you, Miss Lynn, for being obedient. But uh, again, it's good to be here this morning. Would you stand with me for reading of God's Word? Psalm 27. Psalm 27, verse 14. It says, wait for the Lord. <clears throat> Be strong and let your heart take courage. Wait for the Lord. Father, we love you this morning. And God, we thank you for all that you do for us, God. How you love us and you care for us, Father. And that you meet all of our needs this morning. And God, as we come to open your word, Father, I pray that you would breathe on the message this morning, God. And that you would transform our hearts, Lord. God, to look more like you. God, as we, uh, again, as we come just to worship and to hear from you, God, I pray that you would just anoint this time and that you would be with us. God, I pray with Brother Tim as he's away this week. God, I pray that you would bless their vacation and their time away, God. And again, we just love you for all that you do for us, God. And we thank you for this uh, upcoming year, God. And we just pray that you would be in the midst of it, God. And we thank you for all the victories this, of this 2018 year, God. And we just uh, we praise you this morning. For who you are, it's in the name of Jesus we pray. And all God's people said, amen. amen. Hey, well, while I got your attention, I do want to go ahead and kind of make somewhat of a public announcement. And Because some of you may not know this, but Amanda, the first time that she ever laid eyes on me, she fell in love. <laughs> she did. I was everything that she could have ever hoped for. Tall, you know, tall and handsome. Nice hairline, not receding at all, built. I mean, she, everything that she had prayed for, I was, I was that guy. And so uh, she was just blessed to know that the first time she saw me, that she was going to marry me, right? And so I know that may some, be somewhat hard to believe because it really is uh, untrue. But really, the first or second date, the first time I ever took Amanda out, or maybe the second date, I knew that I, was, I wanted to marry her. And so here I am in Bible college um, seeking God's will to hopefully one day become a pastor. And so I'm looking for a godly young lady, and I find Amanda. We go out on a date. I see that she is absolutely beautiful, easy on the eyes. She is not paying me to say any of this, I promise you. But she's beautiful. And so as we're sitting there talking on our first or second date, she's funny. She's sweet. And she can get a little loud at times, I will say that. But other than that, hey... But the one thing that I loved most about her is that, man, she, she loved the Lord Jesus. She did. And outside of being a millionaire, I don't know what else I could have asked for, right? Uh, beautiful, sweet, funny, and loved the Lord. And so while I'm in Bible college, Amanda and I, like I said, we're dating. And um, about seven or eight months into dating, Amanda and I start to get serious. And we start talking about taking our relationship to the next level. Hey, maybe we ought to get engaged. Maybe we ought to go ahead and get married. I'm about to graduate Bible college. Maybe we can go ahead and start our ministry. And so we had kind of talked about this. And so one Thanksgiving break, I came home from Bible college with the intentions of asking her dad for her hand in marriage. So I drove home uh, from Tacoa Falls. And that particular year was the year that Amanda spent with her, uh, her dad's side of the family. And we always would go to uh, Cordill at Lake Blackshear because they lived on the lake. 
And I'll never forget it. It was one night. We were, all the guys, it's 10 or 11 o'clock at night. We're sitting on the front of the dock and we're fishing, catching fish, having a good time. And that particular year, they had let the water down in the lake. And so we had had a few boats there and we had kind of pulled the boats up on, on the sand there, kind of parking our boats for the next morning. And so, again, we're on the end of the dock. And so Barry, which is her dad, gets up and walks down the dock. And it's completely dark and says, i got to go get something out of the boat. I said, man, now's my time to shine. (laughs) So I get out of my lawn chair. I walk up to him. I go down the stairs where he's at in the boat. And before I could get a word out of my mouth, he said, son, if you're going to ask me anything pertaining to my daughter, you better get a job first. (laughs) True story. So I walked back up the stairs. I walked down. I sat in my lawn chair. (laughs) And I fished for the rest of the night. And at the time, you know, I was a little upset with Barry. He had just punched me in the gut in in a way. My pride had been crushed. I had all these plans. I was ready to get married. I wanted to marry her. But now, eight, nine years removed, I see why her dad said what he said, right? Because we've been married almost six years now, and now I understand that marriage sometimes can be a little difficult, especially with me. And I understand that finances play a big role in sometimes in, in a marriage. It's a big part of, of being married. And so her dad was saying, wait, because I want to protect you of what may happen here. I'm going to protect you from this. Get a job, and then you can marry my daughter. And then I also understand now that, hey, life is not cheap. If we go to lunch today, I can promise you we're going to spend $20 at least. And now I understand, too, that here's a dad. Here's a a man that has raised his daughter and said, Hey, son, if if I'm going to give you my daughter's hand in marriage, you better be able to take care of her. You better have the funds and the means to be able to take care of my daughter. And so again, at the time, I was a little resentful, I was a little frustrated, maybe even angry toward her dad. But now, I see that he was trying to protect us from something that could have been bad for a 21, 2 married couple, right? It could have been difficult for us, and he was trying to protect us. But at that time, the idea of waiting was not appealing to me. I didn't want to wait. I was, hey, I'm ready to get married. I love this girl. She's smoking hot. She loves the Lord. Why not, right? Why not? We get married. We can start our ministry and then start a family. Because the idea of waiting was not appealing to me. And in our culture, that waiting idea is not comfortable. I can get on my phone right now. I can order a coffee. I can run and get it, and it will be sitting there when I get there because I don't want to wait for it. Many of us, we can pull up uh, a restaurant on our phone, pull up the app, order specifically what we want, and when we get there at 1130 this afternoon, it could be waiting on us. Hey, I'm guilty of doing the click list on Kroger. We get on an app on our phone. We run down through it. And I can say, boom, I want squash. I want this, this, that. And then they even load it in our car. Now, with a two-year-old, that is the greatest invention in the world. But in all seriousness, we want everything right now. We don't want to wait for it. I feel bad for people who may work in waiting rooms, like doctor's office or dentist's office, Scott, right? Because if you take somebody and you put them in a dentist's office or a doctor's office, you make them wait two hours, three hours, four hours, you see the doctor for 10 minutes, and then get a $150 bill in a week, tell me how frustrated that person may be, right? Because we don't want to wait, I know I don't want to wait because when I'm waiting, I feel like I'm wasting time. I feel like, man, I'm just sitting here. I'm wasting my day away. I'm just on my phone scrolling, trying to make time pass. And sometimes in a doctor's office, we start saying, man, I I get mad. Why are these people behind this desk not doing something? Do they not care about me? Do they not care that we have a need and I'm paying their way, right? Or we get frustrated, We may start saying some things that we would usually not say, and we get bitter. Because the idea of waiting does not appeal to us. 
And even though, man, those things are frustrating. It was, it was frustrating having to wait to ask Amanda to marry me. It was somewhat frustrating. And it is sometimes frustrating to go to the DMV and have to wait or go to the dentist or the doctor and have to wait. But in comparison to some of the things that we feel like we're waiting on today, it doesn't even hold a candle to. Because some of us in here today, including myself, have come in here and we feel like we're in a waiting room with God. We feel like we're in this season with God where we're crying out to him to hear from him. And we feel like we're all alone. And you're saying, God, have you left me? Where are you at? I'm crying out to you. God, do you care? I'm getting frustrated. I'm about to give up. And we're in this, series, this, this time of waiting. Maybe for you it was physical this year. This 2018, maybe you're in somewhat of a physical waiting room. Maybe your physical health hasn't been the greatest this year, and you get frustrated and bitter, and you say, God, why is this happening to me? And maybe we get frustrated because we can't do some of the things that we were once able to do. And you feel like you're just going through the motions. Man, my health has got me in a way where, hey, I I, I, I'm just waiting to go to my next doctor's appointment. Or maybe it's spiritual. Maybe you've been crying out to God about a certain issue. And you're saying, God, hear me. Hear me, God. And you feel like you're in a desert wandering around aimlessly or whatever, right? You're just wandering around, searching for the Lord, waiting for him to speak to you. God, I need to hear from you. And you feel like you're in this spiritual waiting room. Or maybe just life in general. Maybe you've been praying for a new job. You're saying, God, why do you have me here? Why, I, God, I'm praying. I've been faithful. I've been obedient here. Take this away from me. And you feel that you're just waiting. Or maybe it's a difficult marriage you're in. You're saying, God, I need you to deliver us from this. Do you hear me? And you feel like you're in a waiting room. When we find ourselves in these waiting rooms, right, we, we often ask the question, why? God, why? Why me? Why are you letting this physical thing happen to me? God, I've been serving you. I've been serving you. And I want to give my life to you. God, I need you. God, why are you allowing this to happen to my kids? I need you. Do you even hear me? God, do you hear me? Why aren't you answering my prayers? So if you don't hear anything that I say for the rest of the morning, man, I want you to hear this. Is that if you are in a waiting room, in whatever stage of life that you're in, God is not done with you. He is not done with me, and he's not done with you. And I want to, I would even say this morning that God, while we are waiting, he is working. Amen? God is not done, and God is working in the waiting. And I, hey, I know that it's, it can be difficult to hear. Because it's somewhat easy for myself or Tim or Brian when we come to you. And, and we do mean it when we say this. That God is not done. God is working through this. But when we're in the middle of it and somebody else is telling that to us, it is difficult to hear. And you're saying, God, hey, well, if there's a purpose, what is it? Because I don't see it. But God is working in the waiting. And sometimes he's molding. He's molding us to look more like his son, Jesus. For his glory, not our own. And sometimes it takes waiting in order to do that. And he's making us into what he's called us to be. And sometimes he's even disciplining us to who he wants to be. God is working in the waiting. And so this 2019 year coming up, I mean, I pray that it's a breakthrough year. And that man, maybe you're sitting, hey, in two days it's a new year, it's a new beginning. Maybe I can get out of this waiting room. And I hope and I pray that that is true. But if it's not, if you find yourself continuing to stay in this waiting room that you were in, I pray that instead of asking why, and this is for myself too now, instead of asking why me, why is this not happening? God, why are you allowing this? Two questions we should ask is, how will I wait? How will I wait? Well, I wait patiently on the Lord. Well, I wait faithfully. 
loving God and his people. How will I wait? The second is, who will I become because of my waiting? Will I become bitter? Will I become angry or frustrated at God? Or will I fall more in love with him and his people and his mission? In the book of Genesis, we meet a guy named Joseph. And uh, Joseph, many of you have heard this, this passage uh, many, many, many times. And so we meet this guy named Joseph <clears throat> in the book of Genesis. And we see that Joseph has 11 older brothers. I can only imagine how much snot he got beat out of him. Right? 11 older brothers. Here he is. And he is the baby. And the best part about it, well, the worst for him is that he is his father's favorite. Now, I know that's pretty, that's pretty true. The youngest is always the favorite. But in his case, it did not fare out too well for him. Jacob, Israel, right, he gives him this jacket, this coat. And it is the most beautiful thing that they had ever seen. It's the coat of many colors that we call it. And so he gives him this, this coat, and his brothers, his older brothers, his 11 older brothers, start to get a little jealous. And then it gets worse. Because Jacob, I mean, Joseph starts having dreams. These weren't just normal dreams. Joseph says, hey, older brothers, come here. I want to tell you about this dream I had. And so we were out there. We were bundling grain, and we were all working together. And at the end of the day, my grain stood up, your grain surrounded mine and it started bowing to me which means one day you will bow to me now I have a five a brother that's five years older than me and that would have not gone over too well and then he has another one he says hey the moon the stars and the sun they all surrounded me and bowed down to me and so he seems to his brothers a little arrogant He's his father's favorite. And now he's saying, older brothers, you will one day bow down and worship me. And so his older brothers say, hey, let's kill him. Let's get him out of here. All right, let's get him gone. And so they surround, they, talk, they start talking about killing him. And then one of them comes up and says, hey, that's probably not the best idea. Let's get him. Let's sell him. And then we'll dump his coat in blood. Show our father. We'll say he was killed. But really the blood will not be on our hands. So that's what they did. They sold him into slavery. And at the age of 17, we see Joseph being sold into slavery. Now God had revealed some stuff to him in a dream. Basically called him to do something great. And now he sees himself being sold. 17. Dreams. Ambitions, right? Wanting to live this life. Wanting to do right for the Lord. And he finds himself in prison. And in Genesis 39 it says this. And after he was sold, he was sold to a guy named Potiphar. And in Genesis 39 it says this. But the Lord was with Joseph so that he prospered and he lived in the house of the Egyptian master. When his master saw that the Lord was with him, that the Lord gave him success in everything he did, Joseph found favor in his eyes and became his attendant. Potiphar put him in charge of his household and he entrusted to his care everything he owned. So again, he gets sold into slavery. He ends up with this guy named Potiphar. And the whole time in that short little passage, two times it said, but the Lord, the Lord was with him. And so God started blessing his actions. Everything he did, God blessed because the Lord was with him. And in that, we see, man, people started noticing Joseph. And he was there for 11 years. So in Joseph's, Joseph's mind, I, I feel that he was like, hey, Things are getting a little bit better. Things are getting better. Maybe this is God's plan. But then, not only did Potiphar notice him, his wife did too. Said, man, Joseph, he's cute. Joseph, cute, he's buff, he's a young man. I'm going to go to him and I'm going to have him sleep with me. And the faithful man of God that Joseph was and faithful to his Egyptian master said no. And he ran, and his wife screamed rape, 
and therefore Potiphar was forced to put him in prison. So things were looking well for 11 years. Things were getting better in a better place. The Lord is blessing him. Boom. And he's thrown into another waiting room, thrown into prison. Many of us here today can, can relate to that. Hey, things are getting better. Things are looking up for my family. Things are looking up for my health. Think God is answering this prayer. And then boom. Here we are in prison. And we say, why, God? Why? And then Genesis 39 it says this. Joseph's master took him and put him in prison, the place where the king's prisoners were confined. But while Joseph was there in prison, listen to this. The Lord was with him. He showed him kindness, granted him favor in the eyes of the prison warden. So the warden put Joseph in charge of all things in the prison, and he was made responsible for all that was done there. The warden paid no attention to anything under Joseph's care. Why? Because the Lord was with Joseph and gave him success in everything he did. As we read that, we say, man, hey, things are looking up. Things are looking up for Joseph. But again, he's in prison. He's not being worshipped. People are not bowing down to him. He is in prison. He is in a waiting room because God is starting to mold and make him and discipline in him for his purpose. So during the two years in prison, we see a cupbearer come to him. We see a baker come to him. And they start having some crazy dreams. And Joseph starts to interpret these dreams. He says, cupbearer, things are going to look up for you. You'll be restored to your place in a few days. Baker, man, I'm sorry. It's not working out for you. And then, as the cupbearer takes his place, Scripture says that he did not give Joseph another thought. And so here he is, another waiting room, feeling hopeless. Have I been forgotten? What in the world is going on? Then Pharaoh, again, many of you know the story, but he starts having these dreams. And the cupbearer says, you know what, Pharaoh? There was a guy while I was, when you threw me into prison, there was a guy there. And he interpreted my dream, and it came true. Pharaoh calls for Joseph, stands before Pharaoh. He interprets the dream, tells him how to handle it. And then in verse 41, or chapter 41, verse 41, it says, it says this. So Pharaoh said to Joseph, I hereby put you in charge of the whole land of Egypt. So he gets his big break. Why? Because the Lord was with him. This morning, again, many of us have come in here this morning. And we're in a waiting room. We're asking God, why? Why do you have me in this place? God, what is your purpose? I don't hear from you. I don't see you. What is it, God? Show me. Show me. And I I can pretty much promise you, if you were to go and ask Joseph, he probably would have said, yeah, I could have done without the 13 years, 11 in slavery and two, the two in prison. Because they were difficult. They were not fun. There was probably not a place that he wanted or thought that he would be. But because of the working that God did while he was in the waiting room, God used him to save millions of people from starvation. A.W. Tozer says, (coughs) It is doubtful whether God can can bless a man greatly. Until he has hurt him deeply. Now the word hurt, I'm, maybe it's not prison, maybe it's not getting sold in slavery. But I believe that there is a point where God puts us in a waiting room to humble us and to show us who he is. And while we are waiting, he's molding us. He's making us. And discipline us to be the man or woman that he has called us to be. Can I remind you this morning that God is not done with you. And while the waiting rooms may be frustrating, may make you bitter, angry, 
God is working. I think uh, Joseph would kind of echo what A.W. Tozer said. I believe he would. Because 22 years after the moment that he was sold into slavery, he is confronted with his brothers. His brothers have come. They have come to Egypt to buy some, uh, some grain so they would not starve. Right? Egypt was the only place that had, had an amount of food that people could survive. So they're selling food. And so his brothers come. And again, 22 years after the moment he had been sold into slavery, he could have snapped his fingers and they could have been killed. This is what he said to them when he's confronted with them. You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is being done, the saving of many lives. You hear the grace there? The love Because I don't believe that Joseph would have said that a year into his little term. I don't believe he would have said it in two years after being sold into slavery or in prison. Maybe not five, maybe not ten. But through the waiting, as he stands back and he sees that how God worked while he was in those difficult spots, in these waiting rooms, he sees that God used him to save people. And as Andrea comes up this morning, I want to encourage us, us this morning. Man, if you're in a waiting room this morning, again, maybe it's physical, spiritual, just something, everyday life, and we feel like we're just walking along. God, where are you? Maybe you'll find yourself in 2019 in this waiting room. I pray that we would just simply lean in to to the Lord. Let him start molding us. Let him start making us. And discipline us for who he wants to be. Because he does have a purpose. He's not done with us. And while we wait, God is working. Wait on the Lord. So this morning, if God's speaking to you this morning, I'm, we're going to stand as we, we worship and sing. But as always, hey, these altars are open. And would you come this morning, if you find yourself in a waiting room, if, if you feel like that God is saying, hey, I am molding you and making you. I pray that you would, you would pray this. God, teach me how to wait and help me to become the person that you want me to be. Would you come this morning?